Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll call the meeting to order. Could we have a roll call? Bill Brown? Here. Annie Adams? Present. Shannon Brannick? Shannon? You're on mute, Shannon, I think. Shannon's also on a very unstable internet connection, so I actually had logged out and logged back in. So. <laughs> okay. Leonardo Cobus? Here. Kara said she would not be here. Cynthia Hoyle? I'm here. Audrey Ash Ishi? Here. Susan Jones? Right here. Jeff Marino, he said he may not be able to or he might be a little bit late. Uh, Stacy De Lorenzo, I'm here. And Nancy Westcott, here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, next is approval of the agenda. Are there any corrections or additions? If not, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I so, move that we approve the agenda. A second. Okay, it's been moved by Nancy and seconded by Stacy, I think. Yes. No. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, you know what? We have this new rule. I forgot. We, we have to do call. roll call. And yeah, state law says we need a roll call now for everything. We need a roll call to approve the agenda. <laughs> Bill Brown. Yes. Annie Adams? Yes. Shannon Baranek? Yes. Leonardo Covis? Yes. Cynthia Hoyle? Yes. Audrey Ishi? Yes. Susan Jones? Yes. Stacy De Lorenzo? Yes. And Nancy Westcott? Yes. It was unanimously approved. Thank you. That motion carries. It makes sense because sometimes you can't tell who says yes and no, and somebody might have their mute on and say no, and you don't hear them or whatever. So this is um, approval of minutes from previous meetings. Meeting. Is there, are there any corrections to the minutes? No corrections. And is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Moved by Cynthia and seconded by Annie. Uh, do we have a, a roll call? Bill Brown? Yes. Annie Adams? Yes. <laughs> Anna Brannick? <laughs> Anna Brannick? Shannon, if you are able to let me know at some point in time, we'll come back. Can you now hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay. Right. Shannon Baranek? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Leonardo Covis? Yes. Uh, Cynthia Hoyle? Yes. Audrey Ishi? Yes. Uh, Susan Jones? Yes. Stacy De Lorenzo? Yes. And Nancy Westcott? Yes. That passes. Anna? Okay, that motion carries. Thanks. Um, public input. Let's see. Are there any public people? I have one attendee. Oh, that's Jason. I don't see any public. And I, I didn't receive anything either. Okay, no emails? No. Okay. So, um, new business. We have a couple of presentations or discussion items. First is the Regional Bicycle Registration Program. Stacy, you going to tell us about that? Stacy? Yes, I will. I'm. 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 I had the file up, and then I had to restart my computer, so I don't have a file. Uh, 
but I'm getting it right now. Here we go. Can you share a screen or anything? No, yeah, and can I share my screen? I think you can. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Just go along towards the uh, bottom and click share screen. Okay. And then you can select whatever you want to share. Okay. Uh, yeah, hold on. Give me, give me a minute here to, to find it again. Because it. Uh, I apologize. Sharing. I apologize, so let's talk about the weather. <laughs> Gorgeous. Today is not bad. Could stay this way all summer. Yeah, it actually cooled off a little. Uh, I was going to say, we, if anyone read Facebook, there's lots of public input on Facebook. <laughs> oh, really? For BPAC? Oh, it's about the Washington Street. Uh, Diversion of traffic. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're not a member of the Huna Facebook group, Bill. I noticed. But that I now. think it's public. Anyone can see it. Yeah, but I keep meaning to invite Bill every time I look. Yeah, I should do that. Magic of the internet that we all live in right now. Yeah, I think the main comment is there. There's a lot of traffic. Yep. Yeah, I saw you, Nancy. You you said some stuff today, which was nice. A somewhat unavoidable issue. Yep. Yeah. Unless, of course, we can get people to stop driving. Yeah. 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 That would be an option for me. I'm biking still. Yeah. I had to say. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say. Um, just we're, I know we're just taking time. I almost hit a cyclist the other day and I just really want to apologize even though there's no public out here. Um, I was, I, the person was biking where the cars are parked. I was driving like 10, 20 miles an hour through our neighborhood down like Wabash and cross doing this little Chrissy and I didn't see the cyclist at all. I saw her in my mirror. I felt terrible. I mean, I, I don't, I, but I think she must have been biking like up against the curb. But anyway, I would just like to tell cyclists, take the road, like the three-year-old, literally a three-year-old on a pink bike has been biking around Wabash, crossing Washington, biking down the street. I was in my car. I saw her in two different places because of the reroute. I had to drive like around past like down Anderson and then, and she had somehow made it, and she was seriously a three-year-old on a bright pink bike and she took the entire road, which is how I saw her. So, but I feel bad for this adult female who I completely missed and thank God I was driving like 10 miles an hour. So well, we had, we had people honking at us before they removed the parking on Anderson because uh, somebody was parked illegally on the uh, east side of the road close to Sue's house and there wasn't room to pass. So we were in the middle of the lane. So I contacted the mayor and Carol and I said, we really need to remove the parking while we have this detour. We've got buses there. It's too narrow. People are getting exasperated and I'm afraid someone's gonna get hurt. And so the parking's gone. Thank you, mayor and, uh, and city administrator. And it was on Anderson services? On Anderson, uh, there in front of Fairlawn. Yeah. That is very narrow there. And when you have parking on, it's hard for two cars to pass. And then you've also got the buses having yeah. to use that route now because they don't have very good choices for the, uh, the routing at this point. And that route gets quite a bit of uh, use. So there, we had a, a, a the thing that you had the honking thing. There was a fellow trying to get, did not know where the bus was going to stop. He was out there. Yes, that was, a, I've got a video of that. Um, and wheelchair in the street wheelchair up the road and people mm -hmm. are just freaking out, but he was kind of like the three year old. He was totally visible, totally frustrated. Um, but they didn't honk at him gone and there's room for two buses to go by. And you know, it, it, it's yeah. Yeah. cause I, I'm looking at it right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> I across the street that her, if you see an orange car in my driveway, 
that's not mine. <laughs> Stacy, is there something if you want to? No, I'm, I'm so working on. I'm sorry. It, it's if, my, if you want to email me something, I could try to share it. If it's not working, I don't know. If you want, I can pull mine up. If you want me to go, maybe she can chat oh. with Jason. I don't know. I'm I'm calling Sarthak, who's not legally allowed to work right now, but yep. I I like I go through my email and the problem is since we switch. Hmm. Uh -huh. I could say on Washington, cars are still driving ridiculously fast. Oh yeah. Insanely fast. Someone, so we were I was standing out there with a neighbor, and we were like, "They're just going to take down that barricade, aren't they? They're just going to like right through it." <laughs> but I like the four-way I like the four-way stop sign at mm, Anderson. I love that. Yeah, it's nice to have that there. Mm -hmm. At least, yeah. But man, I was just stunned. <laughs> like, do you not? Seems like it would be nice to always have a four-way stop at Anderson. Uh -huh. That would be great with a crosswalk. Would be really helpful for kids trying to get to school and trying to cross that street. Yeah, that would be. For how long is this? Gonna, it's going to be there for how long, Shannon? It's going to be August. 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 There's mm -hmm. no parking till August first. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Give people a chance to get used to it. Maybe we can accidentally leave it up or something. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason cars go so fast is because there's no reason to not go so fast, right? So, like, if you put in stop signs, people would have to at least slow it. You know, you know, no one 100 percent stops at stop signs, but at least you have to slow and go. Stop, so, like, stop signs are not an effective speed control. They just make people speed between signs. They seem to work when I bike further up Washington. Um, if you go, there's stop signs uh, further up Washington that seem to work well when I'm biking. At least people they have to be. Me. They have to be within it. They have to be every 400 feet or so to effectively control speed. <clears throat> but it would make it easier for kids walking to school to cross there. Yeah, that, it would be that's absolutely true. Yeah. There's no two and, ways around. And there, anybody right? crossing. There's there's currently no controlled crosswalk on that entire stretch whatsoever. Yeah, and I think so. that that is an issue. All right, I, I completely apologize, you guys. I'm I'm down my man. <laughs> and uh we're working very hard to get him here and back and and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to share my screen right now of the presentation you put together. Oh my God! Right. It. It. Yay. I'm, I, I got, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. It, it. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm kind of floundering with without him. So. Um, you have to, okay. Like I could just get up and walk around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll have to excuse me. Um, I'll try to figure out how to how to make this be a view. It's view. Right. Oh, yeah. You, you did okay. it. All right. All right. And I have. I have. To, to be honest with you, I haven't had a chance to like fully get this, but I know most of what's going on. I know the the basic philosophies of it. So. Here, here, I'll give this uh, presentation. So uh, the background basically is that we we were um, encouraged to do a national presentation. Um, we've 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 had a I'm gonna call it like a homegrown green type of uh, registration uh, for the university. And we kind of wanted to do a, wherever you are in the, uh, the world, if you are part of the uh, University of Illinois ever, then, or part of the community of Urbana-Champaign, Savoy, ever, then register your bike here and, and you know, we, we can help you out. So that's the kind of the point of, of doing this um, national registration. 
Um, so we, we looked at the options and Project 529 was the, the best option that looked, you know, like it was the most promising. So we went with that one. And um, we implement, we, the university purchased that with the community uh, edition. Um, and I, I'm gonna say that it was I, two months ago that we finally got the purchase order approved. Um, so we haven't really launched it yet. Like, you know, we've launched it, but not like marketed yet. Uh, you see, have you been advancing your slides? Cause we're still on the outline. No, we're on, no, you're right. No, I'm just talking about like just okay. the background okay. of, of right. what's going on. Right. Is, you know, we planned to launch it spring break. That didn't happen. You know, we, we wanted, you know, like, when do we do it? it? There's really not a good time right now to do it where there could be a whole lot of publicity or a whole lot of people paying attention. So what we've just kind of done is put it out there on, the, on our website. And, you know, in, in fall, we'll, we'll do a, a major, this is what we're doing, here's where we're going, you know, that type of thing. So, um, so this kind of gives you the, the background that uh, we went from BFU bronze to BFU silver, thanks to many things that we had done, um, but we need to have a better bike registration system, not only at the U of I, because I pretty much consider the U of I as like a Champaign, Urbana, Savoy, community type of a thing. Uh, so we came up some money with some money to do a national uh, registration. Um, so I don't know how familiar all of you are or with uh, but, uh, Project 529, I know I've talked to several people uh, about what it is and how it works and you know, the benefits of it and stuff like that. It's basically a, anybody can register their bikes on Project 529, but the biggest benefit is if you purchase a sticker that's a shield, then it identifies your bike as part of this um, registration and membership and it opens it up to the, you know, uh, police departments or city officials or the university to identify that this is your particular bike and can identify by you if it gets stolen or one of those other types of things. So that's why we chose to um, go to this particular system. Um, the university has, has vetted the, the initial cost, which is, um, sorry, I'm going to have to hide you guys over here. Let's see, which is, um, you know, uh, about $6,000, um, a year. And then, uh, or it was initially more, it was 9185 for the first year to set up the system and then it'll be about six thousand dollars each year after that plus the cost of any additional stickers that we need to purchase currently we have 2500 um and then if we need to purchase more if we buy them in a bulk of a thousand it'll be a dollar 27 a sticker um and then from that it will be um ten dollars per person that wants to register their bike with a sticker to get the full benefits of this program. Um, and, and here are the benefits. The benefits are bike theft recovery, um, bike safety enforcement, um, a consolidated registration system. And this is not only a system locally, but it's a system nationwide. So you register your bike here, your bike will be registered if you graduate in two years and you leave or if you are a community member or a faculty or a staff and you happen to leave, your bike still will be in this system. It's a one-time 
uh, registration. And with that, um, our biggest, uh, the biggest goal that we're trying to achieve is to be able to inform, educate, and give information to our biking community, such as um, we're closing the bike path from here to here. Uh, or all the bike racks in this particular area will be removed for a certain amount of time due to a capital project that's going on or, or something else that, that will be happening. And then we'll also, we'll also push like the community events that, that are put on and, and, you know, knock on wood, any university events that we may be able to do in the future if any funding ever comes back around. Um, at the site. And then we also hope to gather more information about how many bikes are actually on campus. That gives us data and it gives us leverage about what is going on. And then it also helps us for planning purposes saying, you know, we have, you know, 12,000 bikes on campus. We need to put some money and some attention into the infrastructure for them. So can you, can you explain what bike safety enforcement entails? Um, it, it, this, the safety enforcement is, there's, there's two kind of factors for it. One is that there's a bike that uh, is where it, it shouldn't be, but it's not imposing a safety hazard, such as it's, the bike is parked, on a chain on the quad, it shouldn't be there. So we contact the person and say, you gotta move your bike. The other is if there's a bike that's actually in a location that causes a safety issue, such as it's impeding a um, 8A ramp, or it's sticking out in the middle of the street, or you know something like that, is to be able to contact those people and say, you know, this is not what, this is not where you need to be. You need to be here. Giving them a chance to learn and be educated. Um, and then if they don't learn from that, then do the enforcement side, such as impounding their bike or, or that type of thing. Okay. So our, our biggest goal, again, is to get them, to get bike users to do what they should do for the safety of everyone, our, our biggest goal is not to just ticket people and, and pound and, and all that kind of stuff. So. Would that be, uh, if I didn't have a sticker, I wouldn't get that enforcement? If you didn't have a sticker, you would get that enforcement and then you'd come to try to find your bike and you'd be like, where the hell? Okay, just, just curious. Yeah. Yeah, and I, a lot of people say, why would I register? Because I don't want to have to have that, you know, that fine or that whatever. And the whole point is that, you know, we've been fairly lenient on the enforcement of where bikes are. But now that the university has really ramped up and really increased the number of their bark, bike parking, um, locations and the number of bike parking that we have is if there's you don't just tie it to a tree and when 10 feet away from you is a bike rack um, so so do you need to have the sticker I mean can you register by serial number and not take a sticker or is you that can register by serial number you can fully register without the sticker However, if someone comes across your bike and there's no sticker on it, there's no way for them to know that this bike belongs to XYZ person. So the only, only thing it would be good for if you registered that way would be for stolen bike recovery? That, right? What would be the point of registering? Stolen bike recovery, um, yes. Okay. And I, you know, I'd like to say about stolen bike recovery is uh, I, for example, took my bike to neutral cycle. They are completely out of all parts. Um, they're out of a chain up for my bike now. They were out of brake pads. I haven't had my bike for a couple of weeks. They are almost sold out of bikes. Um, I think bike theft is going to be huge on campus, huge. Um, also, uh, 
not that I would have any direct knowledge of this, um, but uh, because certain people aren't selling um, one item that used to be illegal now, which is not legal in Illinois, um, they might be moving towards bikes. So I really think there's going to be, I think registering your bike is going to be really important um, for uh, bike theft if we're able to recover bikes, because I think bike theft is going to just ramp up, which is why I'm really hoping we get more bike rental too. So it's my two cents. Yeah, and it's one of those things where um, it, at the university, the the university um, public safety department basically has guidelines, or not guidelines, but has suggestions saying, register your computer, register, you know, your electronics, register your this and that. Um, and this is kind of one of those other things, such as if they, and they do. The, the the police system does monitor like sales online say i'm selling this bike or i'm selling this computer or, i'm selling this whatever and they'll check it out and they'll just randomly see if it's something that's actually been stolen and they'll help in the recovery um of it so the ten dollars uh registration is you know i know i you know for being a college student way 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 back when that ten dollars seems like a lot, but it, I, you know, we've already had several people before we've even actually launched this live that have registered on the site. So it's those people that buy a new bike and they really want to protect it and they really care about it, and you know that type of thing. I, I mean, what sold me? I was, I was not. I, I don't know much about this, but when someone said it'll be ten bucks to register your bike, I'm like, I'm not doing it. But in that first slide, when it said removing the shield um, makes it crack, makes it do all these other things, that's what got me. And I said, oh, I'll, yeah, it's, pay, it's, it's I'll very, pay 10 bucks for that. Yeah, it's very theft proof. And we are like, one time, 10 bucks, that's it. And then if you decide, Annie, that you want to move across the country, your bike is still registered under that um, system. And you, know, you can go and you can say, hey, my bike was stolen. It's under this. This is, you know, all the information. Just look for this. Yeah, that's great. It's a lot like a car, right? Yeah, right. Like, it's great. Right, right. Okay, so next we're going to just the registration fee, which you probably covered, you know, mostly. We've talked about, you know, Indiana has it. University of Wisconsin has it for four years. We'll have it indefinitely. Um, and then again, you know, just the, the registration fee. Some of it is to just, you know, pay for the program. Some of it is to contribute towards bike programs, such as education, infrastructure, planning, those types of things. Um, but, you know, there's other universities that use it outside of the Big Ten, but our biggest thing is if you register your bike, we can give you information about what is going on and we can have you in the system with a uh, something identifying your bike physically that if someone caught, comes across that bike, then and they don't, it's not theirs then they know that they can contact someone to try to return to the owner. So um, we use the, the, the student initiated bicycle, I'm trying to get this right, infrastructure and program fee of a dollar a year per student um, to fund getting this. Um, we have the one-time $10 bicycle fee um, it was approved by the Campus Transportation Advisory Committee, and I want to say it was probably back in, like, uh, January, <laughs> if I can get my dates right. Um, and then the cities have, you know, we're paying for it. The university is paying for this first year for the cities, and they've they've decided that, sure, you know, it's, it's a good thing, and We'll help out with uh, distribution of the stickers and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so the, the $10 fee is just for students or like do many? No, it's for everybody who wants to be able to register 
for the system where we can, um, where you're identified as a University of Illinois uh, community affiliate. Again, if, if you want the sticker, it's the $10. If you don't want the sticker and you just want to register, anybody across the country, the world. Yeah. Okay. I like, I liked the, uh, I saw that Texas, you get a U-lock. It would be cool if there were um, tiers, if you could get, I know this is more work for you all, but it would be cool if you could get, um, yeah, Colorado, if you could get a U-lock or lights or, cause a lot of people need front and back lights. It would right, similar. right, it and we've similar. thought about that, and we've talked to these other universities, and they do not have a bike center such as as, as we have. Um, but you know, uh, we've we've looked at having these alternative additional, you know, such as you you can get bike you can get a bike what is it bike uh, sorry late the night, but maybe you can get better lights if you register and you bring your bike in and you can get like lights that last longer and stuff like that. So and, and yeah, that I could see like bike shops offering discounts on stuff. If you bring in your bike and have a registration sticker, they could give you like $2 off. Right. And we actually reached out to the bike um, shops in the community and we said, Hey, would you be interested in, you know, providing the stickers for those that register and bring in some business to your shop? Um, and they're all like, yeah, absolutely. You know, drop off a hundred stickers for us and, you know, we'll help promote the, if you buy a bike, we suggest you registering you register for ten dollars we'll give you a sticker and you came into the shop and you bought a bike from us that type of thing that would be great yeah so we yeah. we've done all that we've reached out to all of them and they they all seem to be you know very you know eager and excited and you know to, to participate in these types of things along with the um the the cities that have also said yeah Sure, we'll help out. Well, and thank you to the, the students for approving this fee and helping uh, pr bring these services to our community. It's, it's really nice to have uh, the whole community covered by this program. Right, right, right. And, and Mike and I were just, my husband and I were just talking about today how um, when, when we were college students a uh, long time ago, that we actually had our $300 mountain bikes back in, uh, I'm gonna date me, but uh, back in like 1993, stolen from our second story apartment balcony that's not attached to anything else. So yeah. we still cannot understand how they stole those bikes. <laughs> It would have been great if we had some type of identification that said, you know, hey, if anyone comes across this numbers of these bikes, can you please give them back to us? Yeah. I'm also Thanks. really excited about the metrics that you're going to be able to have metrics um, and be like, we have this many bikes registered. We have, because we just have terrible metrics on cycling. Um, so I think that would just be just fantastic. You're you're absolutely correct, Annie. It's it's you know everyone's like bikes important, biking's important, but when we have like well, there's 600 bikes registered. <laughs> how, how important is that on a, on a campus that has you know 50,000 people coming in and out? So we're just hoping to, to be able to get a better metrics of how many people actually bike faculty, staff, students, community members, you know, all that type of thing. And I also think that'll help sell the program because people right. want to be counted. They want more bike infrastructure and it's just, they don't know how to have their voice heard. So I think that's right. And the, and the, the, one of the promising things is that we haven't launched, like, we haven't publicly launched this yet. And there's been four people that have already said, Hey, I registered on site, but it looks like 
you know, nothing's being done until like the middle of July, what should I do? And I, I've just been like, you're right. It's not been officially launched. Go ahead and contact me. I'll, I'll meet up with you. I'll give you the sticker. I'll, I'll do all that kind of stuff. So. And especially with like all the bikes being, cause like basically everyone's almost everyone, I guarantee you people are going to be sold out of bikes and it would have been, it would have been cool if at the beginning of this we everyone could have been able to, when you, cause I know when I bought my bike, I have a, I have a fancy bike, but they, you know, we registered, we did stuff at that point with that. And that was, you know, cause I bought it new and I did, you know, so that would be, that'll be really great at the bike shops right then and there will be like, and for 10 extra bucks, we can do this to your bike. And so, right. Right. We can, we can register your bike and, and we can put it in the system and we know it's yours and we can get you information about biking stuff. And we'll also have a, a, a way to, con to, you know, connect you with the bike if it's ever found somewhere, you know. Yeah. Cause the new bikes, people love stealing those new bikes. Ooh uh, boy. It is yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. So. All right. Hey, well, any other questions? Have, so. Okay. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Very excited. Uh, let's see. Got to find my agenda. Oh, yeah. So, Cynthia, are you ready to do tactical urbanism? I am. And I had, oops, here, but I need to go back to the beginning, don't I? Yes, here we go. All right, and then we'll go to slideshow. All right, well, tactical urbanism is something we've been talking about, and you may be seeing a lot of discussion about uh, on social media, and particularly right now, um, the call for more space for walking and biking uh, in cities has resulted in a lot of uh, use of tactical urbanism and creating uh, more space on streets for uh, people to use for exercise and recreation and transportation um, that has been occupied by a relatively number, small number of cars compared to how many people are on foot and biking, especially in large cities. So I uh, thought we'd talk about what does it really mean and how might it help. So I put together a short presentation and I borrowed a lot of this from uh, other sources. And it's basically a, a way to make low cost changes to the built environment, usually in cities, uh, trying to improve neighborhoods and public spaces. It's also sometimes it was called guerrilla urbanism, pop-up urbanism, uh, et cetera. Guerrilla urbanism is more often been when people take matters into their own hands to go out and uh, put things in. In some places, uh, people have done this, and then the cities have uh, created a program that actually then made it a something that the city then uh, tested out and made permanent. So I pulled this information. There's a really great organization called Global Designing Cities Initiative, and they have some great stuff. So I pulled this uh, from their uh, publication, Five Lessons in Tactical Urbanism. There's a whole lot more data. You are welcome to take a look, and I think I've got some resources at the end that you can take a look at. So uh, basically, it's become a movement because people became frustrated with how slow it was to get change uh, implemented, and particularly because uh, engineering by design in terms of roadway design is, is not going to change things quickly. There are standards and practices and processes and procedures. Uh, but for example, one story I can tell you is in New York City uh, when um, uh, Bloomberg was the uh, mayor, he hired a woman named Jeanette uh, Shadiki Khan, I believe if I'm saying that correctly. And um, she was asking, how do we change the streets? He has asked us to give more space to pedestrians and bicyclists and people. And they told her it was you know, a very long process. And she said, well, wait, Wait, let's, how about for temporary changes? Well, you can do experimental implementation for 
a two year period at the end of that period, then you can evaluate it and decide whether or not it can be implemented. And so that in fact is how they started making some of those changes. If you've ever been to New York City, if you're as old as I am, you were there when Times Square was uh, very messy and, um, and not a very safe place for tourists, both in terms of uh, crime and traffic. And now it's this amazing public space that they uh, set up temporarily to be for public use and now is permanently. And, and it's just been a huge uh, success and in many other places they've had similar kinds of sports. So it's been a way to set it up to see whether or not it works to give the public an opportunity for real meaningful engagement to see how it would work, to tweak it, to get input. And uh, it is really hard for many of us to look at drawings and see what that means in terms of what it would be like when we get out there. So this is a way to experience change and give input and make changes before you develop a final project that requires expenditure of significant public funding to implement. And cities don't want to spend money on infrastructure and implement it and have it not work and want people to have and people ask to have it taken out. And that is, we absolutely want to avoid that happening. So here's pictures of Times Square. And uh, this is from their presentation. I have some pictures of my own. And uh, it's the merchants along there uh, have been thrilled uh, with this change. And as you can see, all the people used to be shoved into these little unpleasant spaces and now they're out really enjoying the city a lot. They also had to set up um, designated activity zones uh, for the city's performers if you've ever been there. Um, they have occasionally had some rather aggressive characters uh, uh, approaching the, the tourists and and they also have loading zones and other things like that to allow uh, for the functionality that is needed and as you can see what really happened here is you mostly have the taxis and the transit you have much many fewer of the single occupancy vehicles or which are a very inefficient use of space particularly in an environment this high density so in terms of how you do this uh, they have this process which I wanted to talk through just a little bit uh, as to how you engage stakeholders, how you document and measure, how you publicize, and then if you want to implement it to uh, scale up. So in terms of uncovering value, that's the first step they've got here. And that's just looking at all the underutilized space that you have in cities and seeing whether or not that space can be transformed to improve safety, uh, to build community, to accomplish economic goals, things like that. There, there are different goals in different environments. And as you can see, they've taken this space in downtown uh, Miami where they put in a pop-up park. And, and you can see it's a very interesting space uh, that adds a lot to the environment of the, the community. The second stake is to engage the stakeholders from the beginning, and that's really incredibly important. Uh, you have to have input from people who are going to be impacted. And so if you're going to work on a street, you need to make sure everybody who lives along that street and is in the neighborhood and as much of the, the driving public as possible uh, knows about the changes and has an opportunity for some input. And then during the implementation of the tactical urbanism, additional opportunities uh, for input. But if you have that much public input starting at the beginning, then you've already got a certain level of buy-in pe from people to take a look at the possibilities. Documenting and measuring, you've got to have before and after data. You really cannot do this successfully without that. You know, counting how many vehicles, transit users, cyclists, pedestrians, et cetera, asking people about how they feel about the space, how they would like to change it, how they would like to use it. All of those things are critically important. And then after you have implemented the uh, tactical urbanism project, asking for that input again and collecting the data on the same thing, counting the vehicles, transit users, cyclists, pedestrians, etc. Then also many places 
uh, in most successful projects use colorful materials and art and creative promotional materials to draw uh, it, it, attention to it. And for example, there was a really intense transit project and I'm trying to remember, I believe it was in Seattle. It might have been in Minneapolis. Uh, it was a reasonably large city and uh, they went to the businesses and they hired a special um, an artist with the ability to get public input and they did art projects with the businesses along the proposed route to help them stay in business during this process and also engage them in the process. So there are a lot of really creative ways of using yes. input. Oh, that was Minneapolis. I thought that was Minneapolis. And it was a very successful project. And they did, they did things like one artist did a, a rap video and got the whole public out in public and, and a big group of people and they were all, she created a uh, transit rap, uh, rap and everybody did a dance and a rap together and they used it for publicity and you know, it was just, people had a lot of fun and well, it was a great way to publicize uh, the part of it. Part of it too was it was a big financial hit for all the businesses because they yes. had to shut down those streets to put in the um, the transit. It was an it was an on. Why it was a light it? rail, right? It was a light rail, and so they had to figure out ways to get the community involved. So now the community yeah. has come back even stronger because of all the work by the artists um, and yeah. interventions. Yeah, it was a, it was, uh, I was at an APA conference and, and saw presentations on this, and, and it was a very successful. Uh, collaboration of artists in the city and the businesses that, that uh, really helped smooth a project that could have been a nightmare for everybody. In this picture, by the way, I was at a, a number of years ago now, I was at a, a planning conference in Los Angeles and managed to end up being invited to participate with a group in Ciclavia. And in Los Angeles, the city of freeways, they closed down all these streets in the core of, they nearly, I forget how many miles, it was a lot of miles of street, and turn it over to the bicyclists and the pedestrians, and they have stops along the way with vendors and food and music and art. It was just a giant street party, and there were like 100,000 people down there doing this uh, on, a, on a weekend. And so these kinds of things, bring a lot of benefit uh, to the community because downtown LA is dead uh, on weekends. And so it's somewhat similar to what happens on our campus on Green Street during the summer. And I know when we were working on the idea of an open streets project here, uh, the merchants on Green Street were very interested in having an open street event there because it would bring people from the community to their businesses over the summer most of the time the community members don't come to Green Street because they see it as the students domain and while the students are gone then those businesses are really down and so they were excited to have the street be turned into a space to invite the public in to see what they had to offer. Hey Cynthia? Yes. I think that might be a really good thing to try to promote next spring when the MCOR project is completely done. I would love to do that. And I and, propose that we do that. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the new development, the new private development at Six and Green is done. Mm -hmm. All of those yeah. traffic, you know, reroutes and everything is done and we can show people, you know, the, 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 how great that corridor is. So I, I definitely propose that we do that. Yeah, I think that that would be, uh, and that's a good timeline <clears throat> in terms of planning because it takes a bit of planning and it takes some funding. And so that would give us the opportunity to uh, really plan that and pull all the partners in. We worked with the city of Champaign and um, the um, business group down there, Midtown Business Association, is that what they call themselves? Something like that. Um, and um, and I would like to see us do the open street from race uh, down to um, 
however far west in, in Encore. I mean, it, we could take it to Neil if the city's willing to, um, but I think it would be a sensationally uh, popular event I, and have music and art and all of the businesses there can have, you know, th things out on the sidewalk. You have to set it up so that they can bring their stuff out onto the sidewalk and into the street and i think it would yeah, maybe be by then maybe fine. by then the local health department could provide a like a vaccination van or something <laughs> right and hopefully Who knows what we do if they actually do the um you know as they're hopefully predicting by the end of 2020 very beginning of 2021 if they have a vaccine or anything like that hopefully it can be like a hey, you know, we got through this as a community together and everyone can now come together healthy and celebrate, you know, uh, the great things that are Champaign, Urbana, and Campus Town, and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, so there, get, there can be a mobile vaccination van there. And so that yeah. can be another upsell is you'll get vaccinated <laughs> and you can bike, run, or walk. Right. <laughs> I think it would be a great celebration and people are going to be in the mood for a celebration uh, when we are able to resume uh, more normal lives. I want one now and I'm not that, yes. I'm not that outgoing of a person but it's like oh my god I just want to go out and just do stuff with people. I know yes we all feel that way everybody is getting very antsy and it's increasingly hard to not you know, reach a point of frustration that uh, you say, well, who cares, but we need, we have to care and, um, and people need to continue to do that. But when we get to the point where we can resume being together again, people are going to want to be together again. And yeah, and hopefully what we can also do is, is reach out to the, um, the community businesses. Oh yeah. We, we did that last time. They were very enthusiastic. Yeah. Hey, support, uh, support this. And oh, yeah. people to you where people have not mm -hmm. been able to come to you. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a great opportunity. I would yeah. say the other thing too about the current um, situation we're in is people need something to look forward to. Like I was in mm -hmm. a Zoom meeting and, and, and it was with a, people of a variety of ages. And you know, people, the younger people in particular were like, we did it, Illinois, we're doing it. We're, you know, like people want to feel like all this effort is going to pay off. So I think it's also giving it's also giving people a thing to look forward to and to say like we're going to have this great community celebration. So, mm -hmm. so um, Cynthia, just uh, as you know, just kind of put something out there. If if it is something that we decide to to go forward with, I'm not sure who's going to lead it, but I would I would love to be part of the committee or or the group that helps you know, guide this and, and helps put this together. Done. That won't be a problem at all. Uh, we have a lot of materials we gathered previously and it turns out um, Healthy Champaign County uh, has those materials because it sort of operated through them last time. It turns out we also have a Facebook uh, page that I had forgotten about, which I've been given administrative control over again. I haven't done anything with it to update it, uh, but is CU Open Streets, I believe is the name of it. And so we've already got a bunch of stuff in place. We just need to reactivate and update that and pull together a committee. Uh, and uh, we've got all the materials and the notes and everything from we did it before. The big problem we ran into is we needed some funding. And we just smacked right into a wall of with a, a lack of funding. Um, but I think that we can reapproach that uh, somewhat differently now because of the celebration, desire to celebrate MCOR and various other things. I think that there's probably going to be a different feeling about uh, approaching the funding yeah, this time. Yeah, and it, it, again, everyone's strapped for funding right now. I mean, a bunch they of certainly are. Hot, a bunch of funding's been pulled, a bunch of whatever. But I think it can be a like, you know, hey, we've we've gone through it, we've come out on the other side. Let's re-engage everyone in this community. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone would be willing to commit some funding to say, you know, the return on investment is would be good. Yeah. And in kind contributions. We were being asked last time to pay for uh 
the time of public works and police and things like that. So anyway, worth another conversation. And I think that we should do that. And I could even um, show the group at some point down the road what we were looking at. We would be doing it differently this time because we would definitely want to do Green Street because of MCOR. Um, but I can, Green Street was part of it last time. And so I think we can look at, again, I'd be happy to show you some of the stuff that we had. Yeah, and I don't know if, if, if many of you have been down the area lately, but the um, the east side of Green Street, all the way from um, Armory North, all the way up to Springfield, um, actually up to, to White Street is all brand new pavement. I drove that the other day and it looks so nice. Which, which street? Uh, right Street. Right. Yes, I've been I've been biking over there a little bit to check it out. Yeah, it's really nice. So they've opened up the the, the entire east side, yep. of it and it's just it's so nice. Yes. Yes, it is. And when the, and some of the landscaping is already like the landscaping in front of the library on Armory is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, oh, yeah, no, I, I went out there and I took some pictures earlier in the spring and it's beautiful. I mean, you go around that, that corridor, that, or that turn there from Armory, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely beautiful. You got mm -hmm. these trees and, and the bus stops are nice and the shelters are nice and yeah, no, it's, it, it, I know it's been really a pain in the rear end for the whole community, but I think it, it'll be really nice. We could call it bike the core. Exactly. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And and um, I, I think it would be a phenomenal thing. You know, everyone loves the sign on the viaduct on Green yes. Street, Campus Sound going down yeah. there. And yeah, I, I think it'd they're be really fun. nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. All right, I'll let Cynthia go on. <laughs> well, we don't have a lot more to go here. Um, the final step then is to uh, use tactical urbanism to pilot these approaches and to use low cost materials. So, for example, you can see this intersection is all paint mostly at this point. And uh, they changed the street design and uh, geometry and tested out some new traffic calming uh, designs. And this has all since been made permanent. Now, there were times, of course, when they had to tweak what they had done. But you can tell this is New York City because you see here are fun characters <laughs> soliciting uh, having their pictures taken with tourists. Uh, otherwise, this could easily be a street in Chicago because Chicago has done some uh, similar uh, work as they did there. Yes, and here are some more pictures of the kinds of things people, oops, do. And um, this is a video, in fact, and I thought it wasn't too long. Uh, if it's all right, I think we will just go ahead. It's an eight minute video, if you don't mind. I thought it was a really great video. It's a street film video, and it really shows you uh, some of what people will do. So I'm gonna run through this real quick. Hey, Cynthia, really quick. Oh, yes. Sorry. I, we have actually gotten um, feedback from a couple of members in the community that have been sent on to the, sit, the city of Champaign that says, hey, you know, during these types of things or even during, you know, certain events is we'd like to shut down um, corridors in the university district to make them be uh, pedestrian and yes. markets. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. and I think that now um uh, uh, the agencies will be more open to to those types of things whereas before they're like nope nope we're not shutting down green street we're not shutting mm -hmm. down, we're not down whatever so i didn't mean to interrupt but i thought that i would let you know that we've actually gotten emails from people suggesting that sounds great so all right here we go you'll see some of what people have been doing Is there audio? Uh, no, I'm not hearing anything. Oh, you can't hear the, You can't hear it. No. So what? 
what you'll probably need to do, Cynthia, is stop sharing your screen. Ah, okay. And then, and then when you go to start resharing your screen again, there should be yes. a little box on the bottom where it says optimize for video and audio that you want to check. Yes, and click that. Yeah, check uh -huh. that. All right. Here we go. Share. Can you hear it now? Tapping yeah. Orbitum yeah. is a uh, public engagement and project delivery process. Try things out in the short term to see if we can uh, learn from them, engage people in a conversation about making changes to streets and public spaces, and then investing in those elements that work well and gain support through a much more open process. Tactical urbanism has been around for a really long time. It's very quick, nimble, inexpensive ways to demonstrate how you can change a street and make it safer and better for people on bikes, for people on foot. Uh, tactical urbanism to me means taking a space that's previously been unused and livening it up in a way that makes it more of a, an engaging space as opposed to have it feel cold or dangerous. So the really fun part about tactical urbanism is that it allows people to kind of riff on the idea. So oh, maybe three or four years ago, we started seeing and applying orange traffic cones, which is, you know, cones are ubiquitous in any city. You can find them on the street, you can find them in public space, you can pull them off the back of a public works truck. It's a journey that's about uh, two years old now, I guess. It started in uh, August of 2016 when I dropped some flowers and cones in the buffer of a bike lane after uh, a young woman, Anita Kerman, was killed riding on uh, Mass Ave and Beacon Street. I went to Home Depot, uh, I bought flowers that were, I don't know, five or ten bucks a pot, and I stole some traffic cones from a work site. Then I did a GoFundMe and I wound up raising five or six thousand bucks. And so then it was, I had access to a lot more materials, and since then I've just continued to do it. I got involved with a few tactical urbanism projects just locally on my street corner putting out some cones to slow down drivers. I put out a couple of cones and boom, it worked instantly. Two cones right at the corner and drivers turning would just slow down and stop for pedestrians. It really worked like magic. There's a whole movement uh, around the country setting up transformation departments as opposed to transportation departments uh, in Seattle and Portland and Boston and New York City. There is the New York City Department of Transformation and they've done some really big high profile projects. The Department of Transformation put out cones with sunflowers on them for a morning commute and posted something on Twitter to say that we fixed the Christie Street bike lane. and. This fed into the community board support, the local advocate proposal, and we think, we hope, pushed DOT a little farther to get the Christie Street bike lane project in and done. And it's really, I think, one of the best protected bike lanes in the city. So behind me is the first tactical urbanism project in Rotterdam. The local municipality asked us to to make something creative and connect the, par the different parts of the intersection together. And what is interesting also about this, we are using here thermoplast and because we wanted to do this uh, intervention very quick and uh, very simple and easy to, to apply, we use standard traffic and highway markings. And so we're using something that is normally oriented into car traffic and we make it into something that celebrates more the pedestrians. Some friends of mine in Edmonton reimagined a bus stop and I looked at it and there's little garden gnomes and flowers all over the place and they put an, a cushion on the bench gives the opportunity for kids to play there <laughs> Tactical urbanism is not new, but what was missing is the ubiquitous use of social media like Twitter to spread the use of materials around the globe. Now you can see somebody in New York or Boston or Sydney, Australia or you know anywhere in Europe put out a new project. You see people take that idea and then iterate on it or use it themselves. Seeing what's been happening in San Francisco, in New York, in Portland, it's really inspiring and I feel like we all feed off of each other. Pinterest is a great place to find ideas. In general, just speak with local artists, with local residents, and try to convince the local municipality that it might be a very simple, easy, and quite cheap way to promote your city.
Twitter and Facebook and Instagram even have done a lot to really expose people to the options and possibilities. It's great to see that you know these grassroots movements can just come along and change a space. We've seen people take, say, pinwheels and put them on top, flowers uh, to beautify them, give them a little bit of a different edge. I think that the, the flowers are crucial. They're so not threatening. They introduce joy into the intervention. More recently, we've seen a lot of people use plungers. Again, a very low cost and funny material to be using, but which act and look like bollards. You put out flowers on a bike lane, and that's something different that you don't see every day. You put plungers out, and you definitely don't see that every day. Um, so you can see how this will be ripe for a lot of media attention, for a lot of social media attention. You know, whenever there's a fatality, I like to try and go and visit the site and see if there's something that's really easy that I can do to fix it and to show the city that something can be done really quickly. So I sort of pride myself on getting there and doing something before that. These big institutions, our city government, they can't move quickly. They can't move nimbly. They're not designed to do that. But you as an individual citizen, you can. Without having to be a professional, you can use these low-cost materials and go out and show people, show your city leaders, show your neighbors, show business owners, show yourself that change is possible. We see people who aren't street advocates do this. We see crossing guards do this. They'll put out traffic cones at corners to make sure that drivers slow down when they're coming around a corner and yield to kids in the crosswalk. And so it's not thinking that you can solve all of the urban transportation problems or placemaking problems in one go, but thinking that I'm going to do this one thing that I'm, I know that I can do, and hopefully other people will be inspired and take up similar actions. Even if it's just one street corner, you can put out a traffic cone and you can tell your city, hey look, this worked, let's do it. And so we've seen across the US and across the globe, people taking it upon themselves to try these changes out. And many, many times this has then led to longer term transformation or investment from city departments or leaders, which is really exciting to see. And when they did a Vision Zero project on Mass Ave, they did one section where I'd been dropping cones for months and months. They actually put uh, flex posts in this one location in the street, so that felt like a, an endorsement of what I had been doing. When we talk about tactical urbanism, you talk about some urban activists that are trying to do some guerrilla work, but here in Rotterdam, the local government, they are embracing, they want to have it, they see it as a tool to promote their strategic plans and to promote plans that they have for the long term to do it very fast. We live in Vancouver and the city has done so much over the last few years to engage a lot of spaces and you know, the biggest example would be a place like Robson Square which usually is choked with buses and cars but for the last several years they've closed it off to car traffic and opened up and livened up the space so it's a proof that if you just try something and try changing a space up it can become a permanent addition to your city. Here we go. All right. Go to the next slide. And can everybody hear me? Oops. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. So um, I thought that was a really nice video, give people visual. Uh, tour of what some people are doing. And, uh, and then I've got these uh, resources listed here at the end, the links, and I can give this uh, presentation to um, Barb and uh, we can post it along with the, the meeting notes and email it out to all of you so that you have access to this information as well. And so I hope that helps everybody have a better understanding of uh, what it is and the power that it can have in helping transform public spaces and, and think about the possibilities for how we might work uh, in our community with, with the cities and the university and the health community to, um, to advance some of these ideas because I know um, that, for example, the public health district is working with the school districts now and uh, Unit 4 in particular talking about how racism is a public health issue. Well, roadway fatalities and crashes are also a public health issue and, and one that we know we can an impact uh, with some of the changes that other communities have been implementing. 
So that's all I have on that. And uh, mm -hmm. that's my, my soapbox. Thanks. And if anybody has any questions I can answer, I will try. Anyone want to start? I have a couple ball weight. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, so what happens if uh, the police or public works doesn't like what they're doing? Did they just come in and take it out or are there problems with liability? How, how's that all work? Well, I'm recommending that we do it working with them. Uh, I know in this film, there were people doing guerrilla urbanism and, um, and that's not the route I would choose uh, to take. I would like to work um, with the, the cities and the university to look at some projects. Yes, I think what happens in cities is uh, the guy talked about how he had been dropping cones in one place for a number of years. I suspect what that means is that um, they would come out every so often, pick his cones up and take them away and he'd go out and put them back out again. Um, and, uh, you know, I would rather us use our resources if we can to do it with the city because none of us really has uh, so much available uh, money that uh, that we that we can uh, work at cross purposes. I think if we have the funding to buy the materials to do tactical urbanism, I'd like to do it with the city so that we're all on the same page and we actually I, test yeah. it out and do the metrics before and after and get the public input and all of that. Yeah, and a lot of what, a lot of what you saw people doing was an I don't know what the feedbacks were, but what the, was an enhancement of existing. So a lot of what I have seen is basically they put in a bike lane on a busy road and then people put in orange cones or they, so they basically do an enhancement that won't actually hurt or kill anybody. But um, basically they're like, we would like bollards here. We would like some, we would like some sort of, ed, you know, and enhanced safety um, instead of just paint on the ground. So that's a lot of like what you saw in there. It wasn't, you know, people coming in the middle of the night and just painting crosswalks on Washington. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I brought it up when they uh, they actually presented the safety study for Vine and Main Street a few weeks. Well, it's probably been two couple months ago now. Um, they did present that. What? So the city council's already seen a safety study. I didn't even know they'd hired anybody yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It was done by uh, the engineering clerk. No, who was it, Shannon? Fair Graham. Who? Uh, Fair Graham. Yeah, Fair Graham. Um, and they presented it, it was probably six weeks ago or so, and I can uh, share the link to that. That would be great. We didn't know about it. Yeah, I don't, actually, I don't, yeah, I think it was probably part of the materials. If not, I'll send it out. But they they proposed a couple of um, minor things like changing and and signal timing. But the main thing, main infrastructure thing, would be a uh, island on the north east corner um, to to separate the right turn lane there and then provide a little shorter walking distance. Um, so that seems like and and then I asked about like you know lengthening the radius on the southeast corner because that's another that whole southeast side and there's a lot of empty space there that has just the stripe stripes on it. But it seems like both of those corners could use some cones or something, you know. Maybe that's something we could work with the city on if, if somebody wants to take that on. Any other thoughts? Uh, am I frozen? Nope, nope, you're that you're fine. <laughs> Everybody was so still I thought they were frozen. Okay. All right. I mean, for me, this is just so obvious. It's hard to have much of a comment on. I mean, it's just so necessary. We have more people walking and biking and taking transit in this city than driving cars every day. It's just so obvious that it's one of our assets that makes us a great city, is it's very bikeable, very walkable, very transit friendly. Um, people will say, oh, well, I can drive faster in Champaign. Well, Champaign has a lot of like four lane 
you know, business districts. When you're driving in Urbana, you should be driving slow. You should be driving at a putsy pace. And, and it's like, I, it, it's just, it's just so obvious to me that the changes that need to happen. Um, but yeah, I'll, if anyone, if we want to work, Cynthia, if you'd like to work with the city on trying to implement some area, I would be happy to help out in any way. Um, whatever it needs but yeah it's just so it's just so obvious to me that it's i i don't have anything <laughs> so we got a bike the core and and a project at that corner maybe so yeah and, and i i would just like to to say here bill that um the city set this up to help provide advice on safety for bicyclists and pedestrians so I think it would have been appropriate for them to at least engage us in providing, in, in viewing and providing some feedback on the safety study done for Maine and Vine. You know, we, we were given the opportunity uh, to look at the information or safety study that was done by IDOT for university. And um, I think it, it certainly it feels frustrating uh, to me that uh, we're not engaged when those kinds of things are happening and it makes you wonder if the work if the, there's the value is being placed on the work that we are doing and that we're trying to do. I'm going to jump in here. This was not technically a safety study. It was more of a we're looking at this intersection for a specific instance study. Yeah, it, it was definitely, the scope was not a general safety study. It was more of a, um, what do you call it, an instant, instant study? Yeah, like a specific instance. Like we, we specifically looked at just that intersection for how it, like, based on past design, does it fit standards? Did it fit the standards when it was built? It was not an overall safety study for anything yeah. like we have to do a further intersection design study to really do more that's true there weren't formal recommendations the ones i mentioned were a couple of things they kind of threw out there but i don't think there was a formal recommendation for action was there shannon it was more of just a review of the existing infrastructure and how it um compares to standards and things like that yeah the one um big recommendation that actually was in there was changing the signal timing to make sure it conformed to standards and we've actually done that so yeah so, so there was a quite a pedestrian bit. lead time now shannon does it now have a pedestrian lead signal she said her internet was being glitchy yeah i i, I think it was uh it was mostly a lengthening of the pedestrian time by a few seconds on that side yeah, can you hear me now? We're just yes, yes, exactly what Bill said. It was the the timing was technically correct. However, um, we made it slightly longer, which is also technically correct. So, it, but we don't have a pedestrian lead signal. No. Well, I would recommend that we take a look at that. So IDOT is certainly doing that on uh, University, and I know that uh, Champagne has done that in a number of places. Uh, and I think that that intersection warrants that treatment given how many pedestrians cross there. Okay, well, let's put that on the next agenda and I'll just, uh, I'll make sure we have the study. I don't know if we'll be able to get anybody from the program to come, but Shannon would, would be able to explain it too. And I realize I should say, Shannon, we understand completely that you do not have the engineering staff in place now to uh, take on a lot more analysis of these sorts of things. And that's where we, we can come in. I think we can offer uh, the, um, some additional uh, input and, and a sounding board, uh, particularly if uh, staff is able to give us the framework of the technical and legal you know, the technical legal framework within which we need to operate because I know many of us don't have that background or expertise and so we might come up with great ideas but they might not uh, we might not be able to implement them because uh, they're not we're not allowed to given uh, processes guidelines and, and legal framework 
I mean, I, I guess I guess I'm upset because it was a pedestrian who was killed in that intersection, which is why they were brought in, which is what our charge is, which is what our purpose is. So it would be as if the city did not talk to like it, it, it's just mind blowing to me that we are this group of people that meet every month. We talk about these things every month. We were incredibly upset about it. We had a lot of ideas of what could change at the intersection. Uh, Cynthia spoke with people in the neighborhood that had a lot of ideas of what could change that intersection. I have almost been killed in that intersection, and I am, I, I'm, I'm frankly outraged that this was presented. We didn't know anything about it, and this is the first we hear of it. Um, it it's yeah, I it does make me wonder what what the city thinks the bicycle pedestrian advisory commission's purpose is and why we exist, and. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't understand. I'm completely confused. This, this study was directed by city council, tasked to engineering, and we did exactly as the scope of the project was. As for the pedestrian fatality, please take that up with Rich Searles. Um, we cannot comment upon that. I, I don't think we're upset with you, Shannon, by the way. I don't want you to feel like anybody's attacking you. I think we're upset with, with other people, the elected yes, officials. Yes. So, uh, um, I understood this was going to be an independent study. Is the company that, um, that conducted the study actually independent of the city of Urbana? Yes, Fairgram is a very well-established multi-state company. And they don't have any contracts with Urbana? Well, no, they do. They're our supplemental engineering contract. That's why they got that, because we put out the bid. Yeah, no, they're well-respected and well-known around the country. They do good work. Uh, it, I don't doubt that, that the, the work that they did uh, met the requirements of what they were asked to do. Um, they're not on the bikes, Bicycle Pedestrian and, and Advisory Commission. <laughs> no. Yeah, but are they uh, applying for a job with the city of Urbana? Are they currently acting as uh, pro, you know? All consulting firms put in bids on projects. Um, I, that's, if, if they hadn't done that, then that means that they're not a firm with any standing uh, that anybody would want to hire. I, that's, you know, it, any, any firm that has the qualifications and the capability will submit proposals for projects in the city of Urbana. No, there is such a thing as an independent study with someone who has no conflicts of interest in seeking other business with the city. Well, You're I would argue we want the best qualified people uh, in that to do the job, and, and they are eminently qualified to do it. I don't think they would soft pedal uh, the uh, recommendations based on their desire to make the city happy. Um, I've known other firms that worked with the university and with other entities in the community that in fact did come under pressure to come up with predetermined conclusions on occasion. And if they wanna maintain the integrity and the reputation of their firm, they have to come forward with the recommendations based on the data and the guidance that we currently have. And I have no doubt that that is what they did. Well, thank you for your, for your uh, assurance. Yeah, I, and I apologize for not uh, giving people a heads up. I don't remember exactly how soon we knew that that was on the agenda, but I should have at least um, asked to have BPEC notified that that was gonna be on our agenda so you could tune in and watch. And well, thank you, Bill, that's, that's, that's very kind. I think we would have liked an opportunity to give them some feedback, but I, I'm assuming that their scope of work didn't provide for them to have that opportunity. Probably not, but we, we will definitely uh, bring it up at the next meeting and uh, and look at their, their review. Um, yeah. Discuss. Yeah, just to be clear, Shannon, it's not you I'm mad at. I just feel very frustrated. I feel like we meet every month and we present very measured things that people in the community are asking us to bring forward. People in the community are saying, please, could you help us make these changes? And we show up every month and we try to be, you know, we, we try to do these things. And then it's just frustrating to have it, to, to be like, oh, oh, okay, well, all right. You know, so when, when that, when the Vine and Washington change happens and we knew nothing about it, we'll just be like, yeah, I don't know, they didn't talk to us. 
that just doesn't look good. It just doesn't look good. So, Bill, did you have a second question for me? <laughs> Going back, you said you had two questions. Hmm. <laughs> Not that I can remember. Uh, Your first question was about liability. It was like, what happens if someone does something and then there's liability and there's no... Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of covered, covered the... We covered, you know, my question was basically, you know, should we go out and try to do something like that or should we, I, I think you, you emphasize we should work with the city. Um, that's much that preferable. Was, Boston, what, was that Boston the guy was talking about? Mass yeah, the, yeah, the guy in Boston went out and put cones out uh, on his own and, um, and now they've, you know, more formalized some of those uh, projects um, and done some of that work. I think that may happen more often in bigger cities where the bureaucracy is even bigger and harder to work with. We're and, a small and somebody that sees it would probably just think that some, that the uh, city put it out or something. Some mm -hmm. you know public yeah. might not know you know what all is going on, but I don't know if we'd be able to get away with that here. Well, I, I'm not planning on doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I put chalk on the roads, but that's about as far as I'll go. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not planning on doing guerrilla urbanism. On the other on. hand, though, if, you know, if they keep just not ever talking to us, it like you start to thinking, well, you know, but that's what I think, at least thinking this way and then going to them is the happy medium. Well, you know, and as Stacy said, they're in, they they are, the, obviously aren't into that. So yeah. you're thinking ahead and saying, hey, here's a little thing, you know. And as Stacy said, I think there's interest. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, move on the agenda. Um, didn't have anything under unfinished business or announcements, although we do have unfinished business that just is still unfinished um, as far as I, I need to do the report still. Um, and it seemed like there was something else I was supposed to do. Um, well, the annual report's the main thing. Oh, vision zero. Yeah, it's the, both of those we still need to get in front of council, but council just has been too busy. Um, future announcements, actually this Goodwin Avenue extended, I meant to put that under announcements. It, I don't think it needs a future topic. We talked about it a little bit. Um, let me just, I'll share. I'll just share. 11 o'clock. What? We'd better be on Vision Zero be on the city council agenda when you think the public input isn't going to carry you till 11 o'clock and have two yeah. meetings in a week. So. Um, <coughs> find my screen to share. And I think we do have some announcements. Oh, yeah, I have an announcement. Um, oh, okay. I just, I wanted to just go over real quick this um, <coughs> using the map rather than the ordinance. Remember we talked about, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. Remember we talked about a little bit um, how this right away used to go through here. This is city right away here. Mm -hmm. and, and this is good <laughs> right here. Um, but then when this project was proposed, this one north, Melrose, area it used to be it was going to go here you can actually see the outline where they started to do some dirt work or something probably um, but then they decided to scale it back so this street never went through but in that um, that planned unit development the city gave up this right away to go through here so that gave up any kind of connectivity to connect that whole you know, any anything from between uh, Lincoln and what is it, Fourth Street or Oak? Yeah, so nothing really goes through there. So anybody that wants to go up to the Holiday Inn or any place like up in here to work um, or to just get on Kenyon Road and go one way or another on a bike um, would have to take Lincoln Avenue or the sidewalk or something. Um, this one parcel was proposed to have a development, uh, um, affordable housing development. Um, 
And so uh, the people that own One North were selling it, was gonna sell it to, to somebody. So anyway, as part of that, we got them to eventually redo the plan unit development instead of just selling the lot. So the city has a option to buy this back for the next 10 years. So if we come up with a, a way to put a multi-use path or something through there in the next 10 years, and we have the option to do that. And it seems like, I mean, there is a good, there's a bike path on Goodwin that goes south to campus. Um, and just, you know, there's still this kind of um, undeveloped area. This is the, te the English, uh, teachers of the English office building. There's still this undeveloped area. And it could be, it could make a pretty nice multi-use path to just kind of wrap around there to get over to the Holiday Inn and, and commercial area up there. Um, but I know we've talked about equity a lot in the part of town that doesn't have very good connectivity and people forced to ride on Lincoln and stuff like that. So I think that's a, that was a good outcome to at least have the option to get that back. And another thing that um, it's a possibility, I don't know how realistic, but MTE has a lot of problems with this bus stop that's right here, I think. Or maybe it's here, one of those two places, because people are getting off to and then going across Lincoln Avenue, and there's no crosswalk there between Bradley and, and there. There's no crosswalk. That's a pretty long, pretty long space without a crosswalk. So if the MTD was able to, if we put in a road instead of a multi-use path and connected to Kenyon or or even someplace in between, then MTD could actually make a loop around that way. I guess they would still go up here because there's something north of the interstate, the food bank is up here. Um, but then at least uh, people going north could get off on this side of their apartment and come in from this direction and not have to cross Lincoln Avenue. So there's a couple of potential things to use that right away for. It would develop, it would, require a pretty hefty grant probably to put in a road, maybe not quite so much to put in a um, multi-use path. But also as part of this development, um, you can look at the link online, but um, they already had planned to do a, like a dry bottom detention basin here with a um, path going around it and connect here to this street if it's extended as part of this development. So there could be a connection here at any rate, but, in, but that would also involve private um, private paths rather than public. So I don't know, we don't really have any private paths used as a uh, connection in our, um, in any of our bike plans or trails are all public. So that's a little, I don't know, not as good of a choice, I think. But. I just wanted to kind of update you on what happened with that because we did talk about it once. I don't know if you're. Thank you for advocating for that bill. That's just totally fantastic. Yeah, like staff, it was a lot of work for staff. They took it back and actually reworked it. Lily, uh, oh yeah, Lily's with us. Lily did an excellent job taking it back and working with it and Shannon helped out too. And the legal staff, because it was, it was a pretty big deal. You know, it was just gonna be a, basically a rezoning and turned into a, um, a development agreement that uh, involved quite a bit more legal work. So it took several weeks of work. And hopefully it will be worth it if we can make use of that. That would make real concrete improvements in people's quality of life there. And, and for the students as well. I mean, connect, as you mentioned, connecting up. You know, right now, it's actually a barrier to get across university and Bradley and go anywhere. And that, that really just opens up a host of opportunities. And that, that one north, one, uh, yeah, one north, one south Melrose area, there's like, I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 people living in there, or potentially living in there if it was actually mm -hmm. occupied. And um, they have a fence around it there. You know, they don't go out the side where that road ends. And if I think if there was a path there, they would go out that way and it'd be a lot safer and a more direct route really to campus to down Goodwin than it is to go down Lincoln. Is, the, is there any hope for like a grocery store going up in that area? Potentially where the water company is filling in the old uh, uh, evaporation pond they had there, I guess it was. It was some kind of 
you know, water treatment. They aren't using that for water treatment. They sold it, um, um, but there's no imminent plans for development. It's currently being used by a construction company to to uh, put fill dirt from other projects because they're. <laughs> There's some uh, low area there that can use fill and everything, and it's a legal mm -hmm. place to fill. So they're using it for that for now, but when they're done with it, they're going to sell it off and for some kind of development. So that's the big hope is that we'll get a grocery store there. Uh, but it's going to be a few years at least. Hopefully, though, we'll get some semblance of what's going to happen there in five or six years before that, before that 10 year option expires. Yeah, it sounds like a real, um, a real thing for people to advocate for. Yeah. There's good interstate access there. So even, you know, I mean, it's good for the neighborhood and also be good people. That's one of the main entrances to campus. You know, people bring their kids in that way. It would be easy for them to stop and shop, and restock their kids' refrigerators before they go and stuff like that. Um, well, if Cynthia oh, go Lily. in class, she could uh, have them do that, have that be their project study area. <laughs> if, if they ask me to teach it again. <laughs> we could have tactical urban gardening in that lot until the grocery store comes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so future topics, I think we want to add. Um, we skipped announcements. Oh, announcements, right. Okay, announcements, please. I have an announcement. Um, July 3rd and 4th will be the uh, Urbana Amble. Uh, you are invited to bike, walk, or bus to Urbana, and there will be yellow painted sticks with a green stripe through them to let you know which houses. Um, it is the Urbana Amble Art and Garden Front Yard Tour. Um, and uh, so far, the people who have registered for it, it is a fundraiser for CU, um, for Solidarity Gardens CU. They are going to have an event that day, which will have seeds and an unveiling of a mural. Um, the other, other people will have in their front yards, like you'll be able to build, like someone is doing an art project where you'll be able to build a web in someone's front yard. Bathrooms will be available at the library. Um, it'll be nine to five on Friday and nine to five on Saturday. Um, you are encouraged to wear a mat. Well, if you're within 10 feet of people, put on a mask, socially distance. Um, but uh, basically some people will have free flowers out. Um, there will be obviously gardens to look at and enjoy. There will be a PDF or some kind of map, uh, digital, possibly physical, um, that will state all the different things. Um, there will be uh, Theo's Museum will be on there. Uh, there is Front Yard Industries Garden, so on and so forth. Um, so it's so far the signups have been just really wonderful. Um, so I think it's going to be a very nice low key event. Um, and you do not need to be, if you, if you uh, register your garden or front yard art project, you do not need to be present because people should touch with their eyes and they should stay on the sidewalk or on the street. So uh, you where are invited. Where would they do that, Annie? Huh? Where would they register? Uh, they can register. Uh, there's a Facebook event to register, and then there's a Facebook event that explains the, um, what the event is, and that would be under Urbana Amble. Um, and if you can get to Facebook there, and if you want to register, there is um, a link there that will take you to a Google Doc, and you will register. And I know the person who helped organize this with her neighbors, that would be me. Um, and so I have access to all the information. And it's really fun and really positive and encouraging what projects people are coming up with and what they're doing. So I'm pretty excited, actually. Uh, I, I just, yeah. So anyway, it's going to be pretty fun. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, so Urbana Amble, July 3rd and 4th, there will be, it's basically think of it as like a treasure hunt. You're looking for yellow sticks in people's front yards. <laughs> um, and then cool. also, Cynthia, do you have the t-shirts? Do you have a picture of the Superhero Cycles t-shirts? You have the uh, I can uh, run in and, and grab one. I was going to mention, uh, we're planning to do an earn a bike class with Don Ware Boys and Girls Club July, the week of July 20th. 
and we will be doing it all outdoors. Um, if anybody has time uh, and ability, we usually do six to eight kids. Uh, they help assemble a bike. Uh, they learn to, uh, they learn bicycle safety skills. We do a couple of days of riding around town and at the end um, they get the bike and helmets and lights and a lock. And we also have them do the bike safety quiz, the online Illinois bike safety quiz. And, um, and we've done this in the past. We didn't do it last year because we didn't have money for any bikes. Um, but this year we're doing it with the teens. Um, Don Moyer can't have the teens there during the day inside. So we will be all outside. Um, and speaking of that, I need to contact the park district about using some of their parking lot for our bike rodeo too. I haven't done that yet. But if anybody, if you want, want to volunteer, you can volunteer for one day or more. We're especially uh, happy to have people who want to help uh, the first day with the um, mechanical part. That's not the skill set that uh, I'm good at, and uh, some of you are. So I will try and send out some volunteer sign up information as we get closer. Is there somebody from a bike shop that helps with that? Um, we have sometimes had people from bike shops, Neutral Cycle sometimes has come. Uh, the bike project has, we've usually used the bike project space, uh, but this year people were already uncomfortable, um, you know, with being around a group. And so it's perfect to do it outside. It's well within the guidelines of phase four, which we will certainly be in unless something goes wrong and we end up sliding back. Um, and it's just easier, I think, to set it up and do it outside this time than try and coordinate doing it with the bike project. But yes, we'd be happy to have anybody that uh, wants to help out uh, come and do that. This is, we've paid for this through the Safe Routes to School uh, grant and Champaign County Bikes always helps. Um, Jeff volunteered to help bring bike stands and tools and all of that for the first class. So if someone else wants to do an announcement, I'll go and get a t-shirt and when I come back, I will show you our t-shirts. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements? There was, uh, if you bike out to, um, if you bike out to Riggs, there was a sidewalk that was blocked on Windsor and an email was sent about that blocked sidewalk on Windsor, um, just to let you know, so. Okay. I think it was just while they were pouring a new uh, driveway apron and uh, they didn't think about Fact that if people got part way down there, there was no place for them to go. If uh, they just blocked the whole side, the trail off, and uh, so I, Carol Mitten said she was going to be getting in touch. Uh, so, was that for the Head Start or something there? The no, it was the We Hearts and Hands or something yeah, okay. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a project that we did through Safe Bus to School and CU Bike Month uh, that we had money for t-shirts for kids. And so Annie did a design for us and we, these are our t-shirts. Superhero cycle. And this is the back. You can see our logos there. It came out really nicely. I got, We've delivered to about half the people who registered so far, Annie and uh, Sue delivered in Muhammad. And I delivered some in Urbana. I still have some to deliver in, in Champaign. And I've got a uh, email from one of the parents saying they, they thought the shirts were just fantastic and they're gonna take pictures for me of the kids wearing them. Yeah, there was two, there were two girls, South Urbana, I took them and they, the parents were out on the porch and they called the girls out and I don't know if they were twins, but they looked very close in age and they were so excited. <laughs> those t-shirts, it was like Santa came. Uh, what do you have to do to get those? <laughs> register and, uh, and then say where you ride your bike with your kids. That was it. And where are you cycling, Phil? Where do I cycle? Mm, everywhere. Well, yeah, well, Bill is not at the appropriate age to get a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a superhero. <laughs> um, but we should probably put that out a little, like you have, you have more, right? There are more t-shirts that can be distributed. Yes. Yes, we have more t-shirts. On social media again. 
Yeah, I can push it out or it's on there. Feel free to share. Uh, there's an event uh, that I shared on Bike Month and Champagne Urbana Cyclists and um, Help You Champagne County. Feel free to push yeah, it I out. Tagged, I tagged a bunch of parents, but I don't know if they, you know, how parents just have so much going on that they're just like a form. Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Working, dealing with children enjoying COVID. Yes, it's been quite a challenge. From home, work taking care of children from home, <laughs> entertaining children from home. <laughs> oh, man. Any other announcements? Okay, let's move to future topics. We have uh, Vine in Maine. Let's do that next month, or actually, hmm, I might not be here next month. I'd have to check the date. Was there a vine like vine in Washington or maybe we should have Shan I don't know Shannon you might have already presented on this like if there's like a crosswalks going to go in at vine in Oregon or if there was a there were public meetings they had a whole public meeting there, there were signs I put a bunch of signs <laughs> but no, we're not there's going to be no changes to any of the existing striping or signage other than enhancing enhancing the stop signs at vine in Washington and putting in the sharrows. Well, those are already there, actually. They're just hard to see right now. Well, you can't see them right now because the road's gone, but they were there. <laughs> and the crosswalks, so they'll, they'll be the uh, heavy duty kind of zebra striped ones. Yeah, and they're all gonna match because for some reason, one of the four was not the same as the other ones. Yeah. Yeah, I know that intersection was in the, like, that's one of the selected crash intersection intersections, isn't it? One of the kind of problem intersections that was identified? It shouldn't be because I looked at the crash data and there's been one in the past five years. Oh, okay. Okay. It's just one. It's, it's not a high crash intersection. There, there are occasional crashes, including our own uh, Leo, who was yeah. hit there. But now he's, he's moved away, so. I'm on a much quieter street now. Yeah, we've had comments on that before, on that intersection, but. Yeah, I mean, I would love if that intersection became, there's no sidewalk um, on that side of Washington. And so I would love if that became only one way for car traffic and then it was a sidewalk and a bike path that other open lane. And then it would cut down on cars, it would cut down a little bit on the confusion of that intersection because you wouldn't have to worry about cars, cars could, would have less choices. Um, and then students could walk to school safely and I think it'd be great. And also at Oregon and Vine, it'd be great if there was crosswalk on both sides of that street, that would just be incredible. People would love it. Is there, Bill, are those decisions, have those decisions been made about what the striping and lanes are going to be on, like at those intersections? Yeah, yeah. Are there going to be any changes? No. Okay. <laughs> Why, right? <laughs> this, this project had a very small window. It had to be done in the summer and we had to get it out designed it out to bid within a month's time we it, it did not have time to do anything other than what is already there and fix the road yeah i, I think i mean we heard I about it that's yeah public works has just been pretty short staffed you know the past year and they did have they had to work on this between uh once school let out i mean that was the original plan was to wait until school let out and then start it and then have to finish it before school starts and um could we do a tactical urbanism with those two suggestions that I made? Would that be something we could do and try it out? Or is please, that- Please do not paint on my brand new concrete. Let me list it <laughs> in place first. <laughs> I am going to be engineer on that one and say, please, I'm building this from brand new. Please I don't touch it. I put smiley faces on it, Shannon. I put smiley faces. <laughs> If you want to see someone's head explode, our one paint and sign guy Ray, tell him you want polka dot crosswalks and he will explode in a giant fall of fire. So, 
Okay, so any other future topics people want to? Should, should we identify um, some potential tactical urbanism projects to talk about? That's a great time? idea, Audrey. We could start, yeah, the, we could present a few ideas and just start trying to see like what we could possibly do. I would yeah. like for us to use, I, I would like for us to hang on a little bit and I would like for us to use tactical urbanism to help implement some vision, vision zero efforts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, as you said, I don't mean against the city. I mean with the city. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I would really like to see us. I think vision zero is going to call for those kinds of approaches. And I think we're going to need that a lot. And, and so I think we need a process for determining where, where do we want to do these? What's the criteria? And I think probably high crash locations uh, that are problematic that we don't quite know what to do with or crossings well, that are particularly difficult. That, that could be particularly difficult because then you're really opening yourself to some sort of liability if you're trying something ad hoc at a high crash location. It's not ad hoc though. That's the thing. When you work with the city staff, you publicize the event. It's, it's known to be happening in a certain time period. Uh, it, it's very much, um, other places have done it. it there's a way, there are ways of doing it and they've done it. No one has been sued that I know of. I, it's entirely doable. I think in our, uh, Shannon, isn't there a safety plan, safety study plan for uh, South Lincoln? There, there's that one, which is still very nebulous in time. The more pressing one, because it, uh, there's, I believe, federal dollars riding on it, uh, Florida between Lincoln and Race is a big, a big one that's upcoming. We're going to have RPC put that one together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, well, that one, there's no tactical urbanism solutions to. Okay. <laughs> the, the other thing I forgot to mention was uh, engineering was asking for uh, letters of support for um, a grant application for Race Street be resurfaced and uh, ramps to be redone between um, Washington and Illinois, is it, Shannon? California. California. So Washington to California on Race Street. Um, it's kind of in the capital improvement plan tentatively for the past three or four years. Mm -hmm. um, it, they're looking at, I think, one of these um, kind of stimulus grants that has a short time frame. So, Cynthia, did you get that note from Justin? Okay, I'll forward you that, to, that to you. Does anybody else feel like writing a letter? Um, it would have to be probably this week. And, and I, I have will. a sample letter I could send you. Yeah, I will, I will add these are, they are heavier weighted if you can be someone like say a council member, um, a member of MTD, uh, we have two churches who support us like, it has to be on letterhead. So Joe person probably isn't going to be. Well, a I, I can do it for a healthy Champaign County or see you safe rest to school project. I think safe rest to school is probably more applicable because there are a lot of uh, kids on that street and that stretch. You would think being a member of the bicycle petition and advisory commission would be a thing, but it, it's more than you have letterhead. Yeah. If it's useful, I'm happy to do it. You just let me know. Okay. Only, Audrey, need Audrey, do you have, uh, Audrey, do you have a letterhead that you can use from the school district or anything? Well, I'd have to get, I would get them <laughs> to the letter. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to <laughs> put something down. Um, yeah, let me is know there, if you ask for anything from MTD on that, because if you haven't, I can also ask them. Okay. I think Justin was going to send someone to Jay today, but I don't know if he did or not. Yeah, because that I, all I can do there is ask, you know, Carl to do it, but uh, I can certainly do one from one of my other organizations, and I have letterhead. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll send out that sample letter. Um, and then and the, we the send it back the better, to... We send them back to Justin, right? Yeah, and CC me on there just in case because okay. him and I have been tag team in the grant stuff. So, and you guys can, if you think that uh, you know ours aren't good enough, you can leave them out. It's up to you to to pick and choose which uh, letters support you use. I guess. <laughs> Do we okay. want to at this time talk about? Um, did the plan commission have any comments on the wayfinding and pedestrian? 
bike plans or they passed it we could trust uh, this next time we don't have to talk about it now just to pause okay it. yeah absolutely um there were some comments and everything and they will be meeting to talk about uh the pedestrian plan again um okay. and have some of those comments addressed but the bicycle uh wayfinding plan is slated to go to um the next committee of the whole meeting that is going to be uh mid-june i mean mid-july sorry <laughs> yeah let us know lily so um okay i know the plan commission meeting is online so we can check if there's anything we want to discuss for next time okay um and our next meeting is scheduled for uh, when is it the 21st of july i'm gonna be gone so um cynthia you you can be in charge sure. of okay 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 any other uh, announcements future items okay thank you all very much i'll send out um butter for race street and i'll find either a link or the document for the uh, uh, Vine main uh, <laughs> evaluation. It wasn't a safety study, whatever. It's like, a, I guess it, it was mostly just looking to see, it was a compliance study. Wouldn't you call it that, Shannon? Whether it was in, whether that intersection was in. Mm. I mean, things like that. And I will I will caveat because this was part of the presentation and I don't it's not actually in the write up I don't believe I can't remember I, it's been a while since I read it. Um, there is no intersection built in the middle of a town that will ever conform to every single compliance. Um, it's just not possible. So there are variances from standards in the intersection, but that will hold true for every intersection you will find unless you build it brand new. So it seems like the big ones were like storage for cars turning left. They had to shorten those storage lanes, basically, for the left lane. That was the one that seemed to come up in, from two or three different directions. And wasn't the big problem that we all, that even the citizens, the, new, the folks in the neighborhood and everyone else was just like, no turn on red. Just, just, and even if you looked at all the online comments after the death of, um, I cannot remember her name, um, but uh, that was pretty much it. It was like, no turn on red. Just, we got to just stop the turn on red. No, no turn on red would not have prevented this because it was a left turn on a green. No. Protected yeah. greens are what we were looking for, I think. Yeah. Protected lefts, I mean. Well, we can chat about, chat about some more when we see what they yeah. came up with. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much.